Good afternoon. We're still streaming in from the back, so we'll start filling up a bit at a time, but it's a delight to see each one of you here that is here. We want to welcome our online viewing audience as well. Sometimes on these hot summer afternoons, it's easier to stay home in your lazy boy, right, David, than to come all the way to the sanctuary. <laughs> But we're delighted to see each of you, especially for a theme and a topic as important as the one in which we're engaged. Uh, as I mentioned last week when I introduced him, I have so deeply appreciated Dr. John Pauline and continue to do so. Uh, he's been very helpful to me in the reading and study of Revelation, and I profoundly appreciate that. Uh, if you read his material or listen to him talk, you will understand that he has been interested in Revelation from a surprisingly young age, John, from surprisingly early on, very interested in what this final book of the Bible has to say. So we take another step along that journey this afternoon, and we're just delighted and pleased to have John Pauline guide us in that. But before we turn our thoughts in that direction, we would like to begin with prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord of grace, we're ever and always grateful to you for your love, your goodness, your compassion, your call on our lives. We're equally thankful for your holiness and your righteousness and the fact that you are a grand and a glorious God. Lord, our desire is to walk with you in deep and meaningful ways, to understand you as the God of our lives and the God of revelation. So bless this afternoon. Bless Dr. Pauline as he presents. Keep our minds open. Help us to grasp and understand in ways that we have not before. So bless us now as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Pauline, welcome. Delighted to have you here. Thank you. Last week we spoke about Revelation uh, chapter 10 and uh, identified some aspects there that were very significant to within Adventist understanding and Adventist history. Today we're going to have a look at Revelation 12. So if you have a Bible handy or uh, have an electronic form or so on, you may want to keep that handy so you can consult it uh, when you like. Uh, a lot of it will be on the screen. Uh, but uh, if you want to follow in your own translation, uh, that will be excellent as well. So today, the title is The Biggest Story Ever Told. And I want to start out by <coughs> introducing to you a book called The Grand Design by Stephen Hawking. <clears throat> if you've never heard the name, uh, Stephen Hawking is considered by many the Einstein of the 21st century. Uh, he was uh, deeply uh, crippled, paraplegic, uh, not able to communicate with his voice, uh, but through electronic means uh, was able to communicate with people. But his mind was completely free and able to range through the universe. And uh, he when undertook a search for what he called the grand unifying theory of the universe. Uh, as a professor of physics, uh, he worked with the key theories that related to the understanding of physics and uh, atomic attraction and all the rest of that stuff. But he thought, you know, each of these kind of works in its own domain, but to put the whole thing together the theory of everything. That was his goal. And the fascinating thing to me about this book, which, by the way, was co-written by a scriptwriter from Star Trek, so it's actually rather humorous at times and easy to read. So, I mean, if you're not a scientific uh, person, uh, you'll, you'll find this uh, fairly easy to follow. But what fascinated me was the last chapter where he talked about the grand design. And in this, he he stated the theory that this universe exists for the sake of human beings. This is no dummy. 
This is a deeply respected scientist. And uh, he just said there's at least 15 aspects of physics that must be finely tuned in order for human life to exist. You know, just one small example. If the earth was three million miles closer to the sun, or three million miles further from the sun, life would not be possible here. If the earth was not tilted 22 and a third degrees, if it wasn't just at that point, a little bit either way, and we wouldn't exist. And he gives at least 15 of those, how carbon is created in stars, for example. If it was just slightly different, we wouldn't exist. 15 different major scientific understandings. If not any one of them was just slightly off, we would not exist. And he drew the conclusion, therefore, that this universe exists for the sake of human beings. And it's a theory that's taken very, very seriously. In fact, he drew the conclusion the chance that the universe would be this fine-tuned for human beings is 1 in 10 to 555. You know what that is? One chance in 10 with 555 zeros after it. So you're saying there's a chance? <laughs> All right. So uh, why would Hawking be an atheist then? If there's one chance in 10 to 555 that this universe could have happened by chance, his conclusion is there must be 10 to 555 universes, each of them different, each of them with different physical laws, etc. This happens to be the one where human life can exist. I don't know how convincing you find that workaround, but Hawking made an amazing case that this universe is not an accident. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist contribution to theology is a grand unifying theory of the universe. It's the great controversy. And Revelation 12 happens to be the crucial text if Revelation 12 isn't there, we probably don't have a cosmic conflict understanding as uh, Seventh-day Adventists and many others, such as C.S. Lewis and, and John Milton had. But Revelation 12 is the crucial biblical text. And so it tells the biggest story ever told. A universe at war, good versus evil. Christ versus Satan. So the story begins at the beginning of chapter 12. And it's a big story from the birth of Jesus all the way to the final events of earth's history. And there's three key characters introduced in Revelation 12, 1 to 5. And here's a piece you need to understand. In the book of Revelation, Whenever a new character is introduced, John tends to hit the pause button on the vision. You know, you had the vision sort of scrolling by, then he hits the pause button, and he takes a moment to describe the character and then give a little bit of the character's backstory. This happens over and over uh, in the book of Revelation. A new character appears, visual description, backstory, all right? So that's important to know that that is the case. So you get a visual description and a summary of that character's previous history. So it's as if you were watching a film and a new character walks in the door and everything freezes and a voiceover says, you know, this is so-and-so and this is why he's in the story, etc. So this is what happens when new characters appear in the book of Revelation. So character number one, the woman. Revelation 12, verses 1 to 2. A great sign was seen in heaven. A woman dressed with the sun. The moon was under her feet, and upon her head was a victory crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant 
and she cried out in pain as she labored to give birth. Now take a look at that text. New character appears, all right? Verse 1, visual description. Dressed with the sun, moon under her feet, victory crown on her head, 12 stars in it, right? You have a visual picture of this woman. And then the backstory. She was pregnant, and she cried out in pain as she labored to give birth. All right, so that's the context. The woman appears, you get this context, and then she freezes again to move on to the next character. So the author's introducing characters one by one so that when the vision starts to move, you know what's going on. All right? So generally, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, in interpreting this text, interpret the woman as Old Testament Israel. Uh, she is the people of God in Old Testament times, and she gives birth to the Messiah. And then she moves on in the story, representing the church uh, in the New Testament. So that's the, uh, the basic historical understanding. All right, character two, the dragon. Another sign was seen in heaven. A great fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and upon his head seven crowns. His tail dragged down a third of the stars of heaven, threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth in order that when her child was born, he might eat it up. So once again, you see visual description. A dragon up in heaven. It's fiery red. It's really big seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads, seven crowns. So you have that visual perspective of the dragon. But then there's the backstory. His tail dragged down a third of the stars of heaven, threw them down to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth in order that when her child was born, he might eat it up, all right? You're set with the dragon's role in the story. Traditionally, as Seventh-day Adventists study this passage, we understand the dragon to be Satan. It says as much in verse 9. But also Rome. Because you'll remember in the early story of Jesus, when Herod hears that a new king is born, he wants to find out who that king is. When he doesn't get any clear information, he says, okay, then all the babies of Bethlehem have to go because I want to make sure that the one that will take my place doesn't make it. So the dragon is Satan. The dragon is also Rome and the person of Herod. All right, character number three, the male child. And this is verse five. It says, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is about to shepherd all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. All right? So here you see new character enters the story. But where's the visual? No description of this baby. And where's the backstory? There's none whatsoever. Instead, you get a story of the future. This is what the child will do one day. So what's wrong here? New character, why aren't we getting a visual description and a backstory? Well, in the book of Revelation, multiple characters can represent the same person or entity. For example, Jesus is the Son of Man, besides being Jesus, and he's the Lamb. Uh, Satan can be the dragon and the serpent. The church can be the woman and the remnant. All right, so in the book of Revelation, characters can represent 
multiple characters can represent the same entity. That means that this male child has been in the story before. Doesn't need an introduction. The male child is Jesus from his birth to his ascension. So in the story, the dragon is poised. The child is about to be born. The woman is crying out in pain. And historically, the woman representing Israel, the dragon representing Satan or Rome, the baby representing the earthly Jesus. All right, so that's familiar territory. But I suggest today, let's stay with the story. Because sometimes we jump so quickly from the text to history that we lose track of what's going on in the text itself. The story has three characters in it, the dragon, the woman, and the male child. And the question is, where do these characters go next? The male child, it says already, was snatched up to heaven. So there's motion in the story. What happens with the other two characters in the story? Well, in verse 6, it says that the woman fled into the desert where she had a place prepared for her by God in order that she might be nourished there for 1,260 days. So the baby's snatched up to heaven. The woman goes out into the desert. What does the dragon do? Well, for the moment, we'll leave the woman in the desert. We won't have to take the time to pursue her today. But I just want you to, to see that there's a story working itself out. And when you follow the story, you discover some things you might miss otherwise. In verse 7, it tells us what happened to the dragon. It says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels gathered to fight against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels also fought. So the dragon doesn't stay where he was. He doesn't chase the woman into the desert. That happens later on. But what he does is follow the male child up to heaven. So there's movement in the story. First of all, in verse 7, the dragon follows the male child up to heaven, and war breaks out there. In verse 13, he chases the woman out into the desert. So as you read through chapter 12, there's an unfolding story that is taking place. So let's go back to the war in heaven now. The dragon has gone up to heaven, and it says there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels gathered to fight against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels also fought. And the dragon was not strong enough, neither was a place found in heaven for them. New character again. His name is Michael. By the way, did you notice the male child disappears from the story? In fact, never appears again. This male child shows up in verse 5, exits in verse 5, and is never seen again. So who's this Michael? And why is there no visual or no history? For Michael, it must mean that he's appeared in the story before. I think this is the strongest evidence that Michael, the archangel, is an apocalyptic way of describing Jesus Christ. He was the Son of Man. He was the Lamb. Uh, and he was the male child. And now he is Michael. So the dragon followed the male child to heaven, and war broke out there. 
Verse 9, the great dragon, the ancient serpent, the one called devil and Satan who deceives the whole inhabited world, he was thrown down into the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Notice the highlights. The dragon is called serpent, devil, Satan, the one who deceives the whole inhabited world. So, five different terms for the same character in reality. That illustrates the point I made earlier that multiple characters in Revelation can represent a single entity in real life. So, Satan is described in all these different terms. And by the way, notice the nature of these titles. Satan is the dragon. What do you think of when you think of a dragon? Is the dragon cuddly? Would you like one for a pet? No, all right, they're terrifying. They're huge, they're intimidating, they have the power to kill. Dragons use force to get their way. So one of Satan's methods is to use force, to force people to follow him. But the term serpent reminds us of the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Reminds us of deception. The term devil, it means slanderer, one who says nasty things about others. Deceiver, someone who tells lies. So Satan's strategy is to use force and to use deception in order to get his way. Keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward. But this ancient serpent reminds us of Genesis 3, where Satan was telling lies about God. And then comes verse 10. And in verse 10, it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now have come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers, the one who accuses them before the throne of God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and did not love their lives unto death. So in verse 10, what are we talking about here? Now has come the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ. Where in the book of Revelation does that happen? Revelation chapter 5, where the Lamb joins the Father on his throne and is declared uh, the messianic king over this earth. So the moment when Jesus is enthroned in heaven is the time of his ascension to heaven after the cross. He ascends to heaven. And there's reference to the cross in verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So in the context of the cross, there's a battle in heaven, and Satan is cast down from heaven. So you have Christ equals male child equals Michael, you ask the question, when was this casting down? If it happened in relation to the cross, what about the beginning of time? Wasn't Satan cast down then as well? And the answer is, that is true. But do you remember, as part of the backstory of verse 5, what did it say? The dragon took a third of the stars out of heaven to earth. There was an earlier casting down, and as Sigvat Tonstadt uh, likes to say, uh, that Satan was cast down the first time physically, but the second time he was cast down in terms of influence. 
If you go back to the book of Job, you find that even though Satan has lost his place in heaven, he's lost his citizenship in heaven, he still has a visitor's visa. He shows up in the heavenly court. All right? So the casting down originally was a partial one. He was physically removed from heaven and his angels with him, but he nevertheless did show up again from time to time to attempt to influence things. But after the cross, things became so clear to the inhabitants of heaven that he was no longer welcome there. And so after the cross, he is cast down from all influence in heaven. So it's at the ascension and the enthronement of Jesus, and we would date that A.D. 31, when Jesus uh, rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, was enthroned there in heavenly places. That was the time of Revelation 12.10. And this is supported also by John chapter 12. Perhaps you've noticed this text. Jesus speaking says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be what? Cast out. Same word as Revelation 12. Cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. When was Jesus lifted up from the earth? In the cross and also in his ascension. It is in that context that Satan is fully and finally cast down. So, the story in Revelation 12 surprises us with the connections and one thing that follows after another. But the question arises, what kind of war is this? Are there tanks and planes up in heaven? Artillery? Drones? <laughs> you know, what kind of war is this? Let's go back and take a closer look at the text we've just covered, and I think we can find the answer to that. One option I could think of, of course, is lightsabers, right? You know, that would be really contemporary, but I don't think so in this case. What about arm wrestling? Okay, is that what's going on up there? Or is it a war of words? Is it a battle for minds? Is it a battle of ideas? Let's go back to verse 4, and it speaks of the tail of the dragon. The dragon succeeded in getting a third of the stars out of heaven, which I understand to be the angels of heaven. One third of the angels left heaven with Satan in the original casting down. But the method that he got them out of heaven was his tail. He dragged a third of the angels of heaven down with his tail. Revelation is a symbolic book, and the key is often in the Old Testament. In Isaiah 9, 15 has this intriguing statement. The elder and the honored man is the head. The prophet who teaches lies is the tail. Satan used lies to persuade a third of the angels to leave with him. They must have been very good lies. They must have been very believable lies. They must have seemed very close to reality. So the tale of the dragon represents the lies that Satan told in heaven. In verse 9, he's called the ancient serpent, which reminds us of the Garden of Eden, telling lies about God. In verse 10, he's the accuser of the brothers and sisters. So he's not only telling lies about God, he's telling lies about you and me. And whenever a voice in the back of your head says, you'll never be good enough, you're worthless, you're hopeless, that's not God's voice. That's the accuser. 
So the accuser of the brothers and sisters reminds us of Job 1 and 2, where Satan is accusing God of sheltering Job and accusing Job of not being nearly so goody-goody as he looks. He's accusing God through his accusations against Job. Verse 11, they overcame him by the word of their testimony. Do you see, it's a war of words. It's a battle of minds. And the issue at stake is the character of God. So what are the weapons in that war? On God's side, blood, word, self-sacrifice. On Satan's side, you already know, force, deception, accusation. If you want to know where God is at work and where Satan is at work, look at the character of those who are representing God or Satan. Satan uses force. Satan uses deception. God uses truth, self-sacrifice, persuasion. Very different methods to establish their authority. It's a battle over the character of God. Is God the way he claims to be? Or is he the way Satan portrays him to be? And I would suggest that Satan, in a sense, is projecting. If you're a psychologist, you know what that means. He's projecting his own character onto God. When he looks at God, he sees himself. He sees a mirror image of himself, and he describes that God. And unfortunately, there are churches and preachers that describe such a God as well, meaning well, intending to do what is right. But a battle over the character of God is not going to be won by he said, she said. It can only be demonstrated over a long period of time with much evidence. When characters are impugned, it can be very, very difficult to recover one's reputation. Verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and did not love their lives even unto death. You see, in the final crisis of earth's history, the thing that truly matters is a Job-like trust in God. Do you remember what Job said? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. That trust is not established overnight. As I said, it takes a lot of evidence, a lot of behavior for us to trust someone who has proven untrustworthy. And so the Bible is a compendium of God's actions in the course of history. Some of them are difficult actions, but it shows God dealing with messy situations and often showing restraint where we would expect God to hammer those who oppose him. At the cross, the angels of heaven were just straining for one word to intervene. And the word that came was, stand down. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Christ defeated Satan not by power, but by character, by demonstrating that nothing Satan would do would get him to deviate from his pure character of love, self-sacrifice, forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The cross demonstrated that God would rather die than hurt one of his creatures. God would rather die than strike back at his own creatures who were murdering him. A Job-like trust in God. So what is God like? Can we 
really trust him. I think the Gospel of John is the clearest revelation of what God is like. And it says in John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You know, I kind of grew up with a good cop, bad cop view of God. I don't know about you. And in that picture, the God of the Old Testament was this scary, judgmental, violent, forceful character. The God of the New Testament is sweet and kind and, and, and merciful and forgiving. And, and I struggled with putting those two together. But in John 13, it tells us that Jesus, knowing who he was, knowing where he came from, knowing where he was going, took off his outer garment, put a towel around his waist, and began to wash his disciples' feet. The foot washing was not an accident. It wasn't a nice thing that one human being did for another. The foot washing in John 13 was a demonstration of what God is like. Knowing who he was, knowing where he came from, knowing where he was going, motivated him to demonstrate in the washing of the disciples' feet and that of Judas and Peter, what God is like. John 14, 9 tells us about the foot washing, that if God the Father had come down to this earth and become a human being, he would have been no different than Jesus. That good cop, bad cop view of God just doesn't work. It's not the reality that Jesus brought forward to us. The Father is just like Jesus. From the New Testament perspective, Jesus is the Yahweh of the Old Testament. There's a dozen texts in the New Testament that quote Yahweh passages of the Old Testament and apply them to Jesus. Jesus is the one who gave the law on Mount Sinai. Jesus is the one that interacted in the Garden of Eden, and so on. But the opposite is the case for the New Testament. The Father is the God of the New Testament, because that's why Jesus came. He came to demonstrate in human flesh, in language we couldn't confuse, exactly what the Father is like. That was the reason he came. In the Gospel of John, 98 times, it says, the Father sent me to this earth to show what God is like. I mentioned that I personally struggled with this, and I wonder sometimes if it all went back to a time when I was eight years old. And I lived in New York City, and uh, New York City has something you don't see often in Southern California, thunderstorms. And they were serious ones. I think we had a little, little teeny one here just the other day, but <laughs> very, very rare. This was a massive thunderstorm. You know, the house was creaking, uh, the wind was blowing, the lightning was flashing, the thunder was vibrating everything. And I was in my usual place in thunderstorms on the floor of my closet in the bedroom. Good place to be in a thunderstorm. Felt almost safe. And at that point, my mom came in. And I don't want you to get anything wrong here. I had a good mom. She loved the Lord all of her life. She did all she could to raise me upright. But you know, even the best of moms can have a bad day. I don't know what was going on in her life that day. All I know is when I cried out from the floor of that closet, Mom, why does it have to thunder and lightning like this? She turned around, was leaving the room, and tossed over her shoulder, God is angry with all those people who are breaking his commandments. Now, what does an eight-year-old boy know? He's broken a few. 
and I was sure that those thunderbolts were coming for me. You know, seriously. And I was a pastor for many years, still having that picture of an angry God who's coming for me. It took a long time to break those chains. And that's one reason I share what I'm sharing this afternoon. You see, the cosmic conflict is all about character. Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters. He could have been described in a lot of different ways. But it highlights this point in verse 10. He's the accuser. And if Satan is the accuser of the brothers and sisters, what does that make God? Is God the encourager, the uplifter? You know, the Holy Spirit does convict us of sin, but one thing I've noticed about the Holy Spirit is that when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, always brings hope, always brings a way out, always brings a future. When Satan convicts you of sin, he tries to crush you. He brings darkness. He brings hopelessness. If Satan is the accuser of the brethren, God is the encourager of the brethren. Satan is portraying his own character as if it was God's. God, the accuser of the brethren. It's a lie. It's a lie. What are some implications here? First of all, there's no good cup, bad cup picture of God. That is a misunderstanding of the Old Testament. If you realize that the clearest revelation of what God is like is in the person of Jesus, and particularly the Gospel of John, when you realize that, then you realize all of those difficult stories in the Old Testament need to be read in the context of Jesus' three and a half years of ministry on this earth. God did a lot of things in the Old Testament that were not his ideal, that he would not have done if it were not for sin and suffering and tragedy. But in the three and a half years of ministry on this earth, Jesus showed us what God would be like if there had been no sin. A God who was completely committed to the welfare of his creatures. A God who is other-centered in his love. Wants what is best for us, not to harm us. The picture of a God who is against us is not the picture of the Old Testament either. Yes, there are some difficult stories, and they would be well worth. I, I know that Pastor Randy has preached on some of those things often through the years, some of those difficult stories. But you've got to read those stories in the light of the bigger picture. By themselves, they can be very distressing. But read them in the light of a much bigger picture. The God of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ. The God of the Old Testament is the one who washed the disciples' feet. The God of the Old Testament is the one who said to the woman taken in adultery, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. There's one God in both Testaments. If you have any doubts about what I just said, make a note of this. Read Nehemiah 9. It's about 40 verses long but it comes at the very end of the Old Testament. And Nehemiah 9 tells the story of Ezra reviewing the entire history of the Old Testament, starting with creation, uh, moving to uh, Abraham, moving to the Exodus, moving to the judges, moving to the monarchy, working its way to exile and beyond. It tells the story of the Old Testament. And there's two messages that come out in that story. Number one, 
God is gracious. God is merciful. God loves his people. But they rebelled against him. And they did the things that were wrong, etc. But then he moves to the next area. Nevertheless, God is faithful. God is merciful. God is kind. God loved them. Nevertheless, they rebelled. It goes over and over and over again. Two messages in Nehemiah chapter 9, that God is relentlessly faithful, relentlessly loving, relentlessly merciful. And Israel, sadly, was relentlessly a mess. That's the story of the Old Testament. You read it out of the context of Nehemiah 9, out of the context of John 14, and you can get a distorted picture of what God is like. God took a big risk in allowing many of the stories that end up in the Old Testament, but read in the light of Jesus, they ultimately make sense. There's implications in the cosmic conflict for religion and politics as well. The cosmic conflict is universal. Every planet is involved. Every nation on this earth is involved. Every religion is involved. Every political party is involved. Every human being is involved. We are all part of that cosmic conflict. And you know what that means? That means that God is at work in the Democratic Party. And Satan is at work in the Democratic Party. God is at work in the other party as well. And Satan is at work. God is at work within Islam. And Satan is at work. That's what the cosmic conflict implies. And what it means is that we can never give our ultimate allegiance to any earthly entity. God is at work in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Is that the end of the story? No, it's not. The cosmic conflict is universal, and every experience of our lives, every encounter Everything we get connected to is all part of this much bigger picture. We can never give our ultimate allegiance to a political party, to a nation, or even a religion, because ultimately we must obey God rather than human beings. And sadly, religions often get it wrong. And so our allegiance to God must be to him first. Some other implications, though. This is a very important biblical concept. You become like the God you worship. If the God you worship is severe, unforgiving, judgmental, cruel, you become more and more like that. If the God you worship is gracious, kind, loving, forgiving, you become more and more like that. It's a law of life. By beholding, you become changed. If you want to know what your picture of God is, ask yourself, how do I treat other people? You become like the kind of God you worship. So this picture of God thing is really, really critical to who we become in this life. Jesus is the clearest revelation of God that ever was or ever will be. But here's the exciting addition to that. You are the clearest picture of God some will ever see. You are the clearest picture of God that some will ever see. When we take the name of God, when we join a church, and by the way, don't don't think that I'm speaking against the Adventist church or any church specifically. I'm simply saying when you identify with a church, 
your behavior tells the world what God is like. When you say, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, people assume that God will be like you, that you would become like the God you worship. So how we treat other people becomes an essential part of our witness. The behavior of professing Christians testifies to the character of the God that they worship. Accusers of the brethren are unwittingly demonstrating the character of Satan. And when I say that, I'm not really looking at you. I have failed so many times in that regard. It's so easy sometimes to be critical. It's so easy to point the finger. It's so natural to sinful humanity. And then you look at the face of Jesus and you know how to live. I'd like to make a commitment and invite you to join me in that commitment. And that is I want my life as well as my words to speak well of God. Amen. John, I so much appreciated all of what you said. I loved where you ended with that closing commitment because that really is the, the profound and the ongoing commitment of those of us who are privileged to walk with Jesus, to journey with Jesus. So as you were talking, I was thinking about this focus on the character of God, which I agree with profoundly, and how different that is from how I experienced revelation in my earlier years in ministry. My early years in ministry, our revelation seminars were focused on our beliefs as a, as a church, as a denomination. I understand the importance of that, and I don't mean to be overly critical of it, but it's a very different approach. And so I guess one of the questions I want to ask you to start with, and by the way, we want to hear your questions, but I want to start with a question or two here. When you look at your years, and there have been many years of studying Revelation, is there any way you can identify the most important impact that study has had on you as a person? Is it that closing commitment? Is it something else? What's been the most meaningful impact on you? Well, I think the book of Revelation is important, uh, particularly for some reasons we'll get into in the next couple of, of sessions. Uh, it won't be next week, but the week after and, and August 26. Um, so we'll get into some of those things. The book of Revelation, in a sense, I think we mentioned this last time, is like value added. But for me, I think it was the book of Romans and the Gospel of John. You know, what, what I shared today, the foot washing. And so, I mean, that, it just blew me away. Foot washing story, I've known it all my life. But to read verse 3 of chapter 13 and realize that Jesus did that consciously as a demonstration of what the Father would do in the same situation. I mean, that just blew me away. And uh, so that was, a, that was a very critical point, uh, I would say. And then in Romans, um, the discovery of a God who, as it says in Romans 3.24, uh, we are say, justified freely by his grace, which is using the word for grace and gift twice to really maximize it, to multiply it. We're justified freely by his grace, uh, meaning that no amount of praying, uh, no amount of preaching, uh, no amount of giving out of tracts, uh, none of that earns in any way God's favor. His favor is given freely. And it's the discovery of that fact that liberates us from the burden of performance. It doesn't mean we stop performing, but we now perform freely. We, it's a gift that we can give to God and give to others. 
Whereas before that, I think all of my ministry was simply trying to make God happy so that he would save me ultimately. You know, if I did a good enough job in the ministry, maybe I would make it too, you know. And I'll be honest about that. That's, that. That was in the back of my mind and a lot of that. It wasn't until I was freed to realize my salvation's not at stake here. And that means if I do something good for anyone else, it's a gift. It's a free gift. I'm not earning anything. I'm simply saying, thank you, God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this because uh, I just love trying to be more and more like you. So uh, wanting to be like Jesus you know, it's more than just a statement. It's, it's got to be a way of life. Uh, and for me, that's, uh, that's become a way of life. doesn't mean getting there. It just means that's the desire, that's the goal. That's, that's what I live for. That's so beautiful because that, I think, captures so much, not only of Romans and of John, but of the New Testament as a whole. But it, it, it comes back on the book of Revelation now. So that's, that's where you started with that question. I wouldn't say it was the book of Revelation that changed my thinking. But as my thinking changed on the basis of other parts of the New Testament, Revelation became a new book as well. Wow, that is beautiful. We want to hear your questions, so I, I want you to get them ready. I have one other question about something you said just a little bit ago this afternoon. John, which I've heard you mention before, and it's something I just want to make sure that those of us who are gathered here and those joining us on the broadcast capture. I can't capture your exact words, but they were basically that were it not for Revelation 12, we would not have an understanding of this cosmic conflict or this great controversy theme that we currently have. Do you mind stating and unpacking that again just a little bit more? Mm -hmm. uh, I found that to be a really important concept. There are hints all over the Bible of a cosmic conflict, but it's not a coherent story. It's in Revelation 12 when it, it says plainly, there was war in heaven. The war is between Christ and Satan. Uh, the war is over the character of God. So it gives us the grounds to now look elsewhere and find. And in chapter 12, it alludes to Genesis 3. So we wouldn't know that that was Satan from Genesis, just as the serpent, all right? And snakes are fun for a few people, like Bill Hayes, but not for most of us, you know? So, I mean, it's scary enough by itself, but to discover in Revelation 12, no, that was Satan there speaking through that snake. Um, it alludes to Isaiah 14. It alludes to Ezekiel 28, which are texts on the surface, not about the war in heaven. It's talking about the king of Tyre and the king of Babylon. And so you could easily read those texts without the bigger story in mind. But thanks to Revelation 12, it kind of ties all those threads together. And now we can go to Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and say, oh, that's how it all got started, all right? So the war that Revelation 12 is talking about got started here. And uh, that, I think, uh, you know, is why Revelation 12, I think, is critical. Without that, I don't know if we would have the whole story. Ephesians 1 is a forgotten text because Ephesians 1 goes from eternity past to eternity future, from highest heaven to lowest earth, and it says that the key issue in the universe is unifying everything in Christ. No reference to Satan there, no reference to the dark side. It simply says, it, it hints there's a broken universe. There's something wrong in this universe because it needs to be unified. That's all it's saying. It just gives us the positive side. So Ephesians 1 uh, gives the biggest picture that the number one issue in the universe is its brokenness, is the estrangement, uh, is the need to reconcile and bring everything back together. And that's a very important piece to the larger picture, I think. That's really helpful. I hope you, you've registered that in your minds because there are many who miss that. I was, years ago, I was preaching on something that I had to use Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Mm -hmm. And I went into some of the commentaries that I had and found this piece totally lacking. It was focused only on the king of Tyre, etc. That was the only thing they saw there, and I thought, wow, 
How can that be missed here? But I think you're right. Without Revelation 12 being drawn in, we do miss some of those key realities. Okay, there's a QR code that's up. I can see it on the screens that we're facing. I'm trusting you can see it somewhere. I know our viewers can see them. What I neglected to come with, Miguel, was, a, was something to know what the questions are. So I don't know if you have a mic and you can read us the questions that come up, or if you have questions. Uh, there are some hands here as well, so if we don't have those coming in on the mic, I mean on the QR code, then there are hands. Can we get Miguel a mic here? So right back here, Miguel, right in the middle aisle, gentleman in the light. What color shirt is that, John? Is that teal? Green? Blue? Oh, Something like there. that. Okay. Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of teal. There you go. <laughs> Aquamarine? Uh. I have a question on Revelation 12, 12 and Revelation 12:17. Essentially, what it said in those verses is that the devil was angry at the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. And in Revelation 17, it said we know who they are. Those are the ones that keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, it comes to my mind that the center of the controversy, as we are taught in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Later on, one of those is the, the, the fourth commandment, which is at the center of the Ten Commandments, keeping the Sabbath day holy. Now, it brings to my mind the teaching of Seventh-day Adventists that said the Sabbath is the seal of God, and the mark of the beast is Sunday keeping, which will be manifested later on when the Sunday law is proclaimed or instituted. And it brings to my mind... Uh, Dr. John Pollan's lecture that I saw in YouTube, I think some time back, in a California conference, where he said Sunday law may or may not happen, and, or could, could not happen. And this brings a question to my mind. If that is so, that it will not happen, then is it wrong then, that what we're teaching, that the Sabbath is the seal of God? And the mark of the beast is Sunday keep Sunday keeping. Because okay, thank if you for so, your question. You got quite an extended. We've we've covered several things in there, so we want to keep it focused and as short as possible. But I know you're going to address some of these things dealing with remnant and so forth in a couple of weeks. I don't know how much you might want to speak to here. Yeah, a lot a lot of what you're saying, we will address. Uh, the next couple of sessions uh, uh, as well. But I, I do want to speak to the question that you are raising. Uh, I think that uh, has been widely misunderstood. I think some of the critics never watched the first two parts of that series, and therefore they didn't have the background to understand what I was saying. And so I think it's been mischaracterized uh, to a large degree. Uh, it is very, very clear within Revelation itself these connections, seal of God, mark of the beast, all right? Uh, the mark of the, it doesn't say Sunday in Revelation 13, but it's clearly a counterfeit of Sabbath. So uh, the uh, interpretation that has been given traditionally in the past, I think is very sound. Uh, the specific question is, what concerned me and the reason for that whole series is I found out during COVID doing seminars around the world that the number one subject of conversation is a Sunday, national Sunday law in Congress. And that was based on two statements that Ellen White made in 1888. She never made them before, she never made them after. But at the time she made them, there was a Sunday law in Congress at that very moment. She was talking current events. And I have no question that if Jesus had come within the next five or 10 years, that that's exactly what would have happened. What concerns me is when you take such a specific item and you're looking for that. People around the world are looking for that. That will be for them the sign of the end. And as I've studied biblical prophecy, classical prophecy, classical prophecy is about what could be Take the story of Jonah, for example. 
It could be, God says, Assyria is marked for destruction. Now, Jonah says, 40 days, it's going to happen. But Assyria repented, and God in his grace and mercy forgave them, and Assyria survived uh, to live another day. So, there are so many prophecies in the Old Testament that when you get to the fulfillment, it's often a surprise. And so, my concern was not to undermine the teaching of Sunday law and all the rest of that. My concern was that if people are focusing on this specific thing, a law passing in Congress, as the sign, you know, that things are about to happen, I was concerned that when you read it in that inflexible way, uh, it could lead us into trouble. Keep in mind the Pharisees were very careful students of prophecy, and they had charts of end-time events, of what would happen when Messiah comes. And they were so specific that when Messiah came, they rejected him because he didn't meet what they were looking for. He didn't fit with their expectations. So, the whole point of my series was not to trouble the saints except in this sense. Don't be so certain of every detail that if God chooses to do things a little bit differently, that you will end up on the wrong place. In that fact, was my concern. That's happened in the past. And if you look at the 2,000 years of Christian history, Leroy Edwin Froome, yes. the success rate of predicting specific things in the future on the basis of Bible prophecy is very, very low. It seems to me, in fact, that it is much more common that prophecy is understood in retrospect yeah. rather than in prospect. So, one of the, one of the approaches to Revelation says, uh, be very clear about the big picture pieces, be more tentative about the details and the small fine print below, and, and be cautious about being too dogmatic about some of those elements, which I think yeah. flows out of what you're saying. Well, I could point out Isaiah 11. You have a prophecy of uh, Babylon's fall, and it has four details. And when you get to the fulfillment, it's very clear this is the fulfillment, but every one of those details is fulfilled in a slightly different way than was expected. For example, it says that God will use an east wind to dry up the Euphrates River so that Israel can escape on the riverbed in their sandals. In the actual event, it was Cyrus' engineers that dried up the river, and Israel walked across the bridges because they had a free pass from the emperor. So, you see, the fulfillment was the fulfillment. It was clear when it got there what, it, what was happening. Why then did the prophecy, quote, get it wrong? It didn't get it wrong. What the prophet was saying was that God will do what he did in the Exodus again. And in the Exodus, it was an east wind that dried up the Red Sea, and they walked across in their sandals. He says, what God did in the Exodus, he will do again. But if you made the prophecy too specific, you would end up missing the real thing when it came. So that's my concern. Uh, it could very well happen exactly the way Great Controversy says, but after 150 years, uh, she didn't have cell phones, there was no nuclear war, there was no space travel, no internet, uh, no streaming video, etc. The world is such a different place, it would be surprising if every detail of the final events turned out exactly the way it said. After all, one of those details is that only white people will be saved. Well, no, not exactly. I got that wrong, okay? You scared me for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but that she says, when Jesus comes, all who are well, working uh, to receive him, their faces will grow pale. Now, that makes perfect sense in 1847 when the church was predominantly Caucasian, okay? But she also says a few years after, perhaps when things had changed a little bit, she says that when Jesus comes, the shackles will fall off the slaves and their masters will be confounded. 
Makes perfect sense in 1855, okay? But will that detail be fulfilled at the end? Maybe it will. But I'm saying, if you focus on those details, you may end up missing the real thing when it comes. That's my concern. And Make, like I said, the preparation for all that, the critics missed. They just watched a right. controversial piece and made judgments based on not really understanding my point. It makes me think of 1 Thessalonians 4, and I suppose you could argue Paul uses the royal we, or maybe he literally understands it this way. But in speaking of the coming of Christ, and speaking of the fact that he will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice, the archangel of the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then he says, then we who are alive will be caught up with them to meet the, the Lord in the clouds, and so we'll be with the Lord forever. We, so using the royal we, or does he have a conviction that Jesus is coming very, very soon? Uh, one could wonder. Okay, over here somewhere I understand? Where's there are nine questions online as well. There are, oh, there okay. are a bevy of questions. Why don't we questions. intersperse them? Let's yes. intersperse them. Miguel, please. Sure. Uh, so there are three questions uh, that, are, that are similar in tenor. And it seems like the idea of the Old Testament and the New Testament, God really struck a chord with our audience. So the, question, um, the questions that are pertaining to that are, what do we do with the violent narratives, particularly those where it seems like God tells Israel to wipe out the Canaanites? Was that the same Jesus of the New Testament? How can we make sense of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent questions, and, and I'm probably not prepared to speak in detail in relation to that. But once again, there are some certain texts in which God acts in ways. Uh, let's just take the flood story as an example. And uh, if, if you understand that to be a judgment of God uh, directly, then uh, one would say, well, God wiped out men, women, and children. You know? So, I mean, you can look at that story and develop an idea of God. But when you look at the Jesus of the New Testament, is there another way to read the story? And I would point this out, okay? God doesn't have to kill anybody for them to die. Every breath that I breathe is a gift of God, God's sustaining, life-giving power. You cut me off from God, and I'm gone, all right? God does not need to kill anyone. If he stops sustaining us, we will die instantly. So to me, that puts a little bit of a, uh, of a different kind of picture on it. And um, let's look at the flood story this way, right? Just giving an example, uh, Miguel, to, in response to that. Another way you could read the flood story is suspending water in the atmosphere takes an awful lot of energy. All right, let's say the Holy Spirit is doing that. So be, before the flood, you had the waters above and the waters below, and when those waters come together, the, the earth gets flooded, all right? It takes a lot of energy to hold that up. The Holy Spirit is preserving the earth for the people on this earth, but the people on this earth said, we don't want you. We don't want God. We don't want you. And eventually, God says, they don't want us, let it go. But let's make provision that no one will be lost who is willing to be saved. So God makes provision to save everyone, but when the time comes and the Holy Spirit withdraws, the uh, entire environment implodes. Interestingly enough, when Ellen White talks about the end of time, she describes it as the Holy Spirit withdrawing from the earth. Right, right. And so that to me is, if the flood story is a model for the end time, then you go back to the flood story, the Holy Spirit withdrew from the earth and the earth collapsed of its own weight. So it's a judgment of God, yes, but it's not a judgment of God smiting the earth uh, it's a judgment of God reluctantly 
backing off because he's not wanted. Exactly. So to me, that could put, and, and you know, we could go through those stories and explore uh, each of them in that way, but uh, that maybe will be helpful for now. Thank you very much. A hand toward the back. Okay, I'm not seeing if I'm looking the right way. So, Miguel, maybe it's over to you again. Sure. One of the questions that, that came in as well says, uh, and I'll read it as it is stated, I loved what you mentioned in regard to us being saved by the blood of Jesus as we walk in relationship with him. However, some pastors have stated, unless we stop listening to certain types of music or stop watching certain movies, we cannot or will not be saved. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you know what they say in Texas, John, there's only two kinds of music, country and western. <laughs> and I never heard of any one of them until I met my wife. <laughs> I was a New York City boy. <laughs> she came from a farm in North Dakota and introduced me to country music, and uh, I'm still working on an appetite for that. But <laughs> Anyway, yeah, where were we? <laughs> if you don't stop listening to certain kinds of music or certain kinds of movies, you won't be saved. If yeah, I think there's that. an element of truth, you know, in all of that. And uh, God is the one who knows best. Uh, you know, I think there are people for whom music is very dangerous, can lead them, you know, in a track that uh, they end up losing their way. Uh, there are others that uh, the same music uh, might actually be uplifting and so on. So I'm not sure there's a one-size-fits-all here. Uh, we have to be careful when we preach not to put out too many one-size-fits-all, uh, I think. Uh, are there, uh, you know, people who lose their way because of music and videos and movies? I think so. Uh, one friendship that uh, has developed through the years is a friendship with Ted Bear, who is the... Uh, founder of Movie Guide, which was a movie review uh, from a Christian perspective. And he's got degrees in law and philosophy and all kinds of things. So he knows what goes on behind the scenes in the movies. And he, through the movie reviews, he helps people make decisions, sound decisions. Uh, one way to deal with movies is not see them at all, okay? And for many people, that may be the only way that they can you know, survive spiritually. Uh, others uh, enjoy having some family time in that way. And having those reviews, we started 40 years ago with that. We didn't have television when our kids started, so we were very, you know, very straight-laced and all of that. And then realized they were watching in other people's places <laughs> and things like that. So then we said, well, maybe it's better that we have it, but we know what we're going to see. No television, no broadcast, never had broadcast, even to this day. Of course, now it's streaming. I don't know what the difference is anymore. Uh, so what Ted Baer suggests is learn to discern. You've got to know, you know what you're getting into. You've got to be able to discern and, and not just watch with your brain shut off, but just say, okay, guys, let's talk about this. Uh, what that character said to the other character, are you comfortable with that? You know, what, is, what does God have to say about that? And, and being very thoughtful about it, I think, is another way that people can approach it. So I, I think the issue, the only issue I'd have with that question is a once all, you know, one, one size fits all kind of a thing. But uh, uh, in our own marriage experience, we have addressed those in different ways, and I think, uh, I think uh, God has blessed. Thank you very much, John. Maybe one more question. Is there somebody in? Okay, we've got right down here. Art, if you can bring the mic over. We may actually have a couple of hands here, but uh, right over here to the front, Art Fur, there you go. Uh, keep going this way to the right. And, uh. mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, last week, uh, you uh, m and mentioned that the gospel would be uh, expanded at the end of time. And I was wondering, have you written about what that delineates in detail uh, and what that entails? Okay, have I written about what? 
Uh, you mentioned last week that at the, at the end of time, the gospel would be promulgated one more time. One more time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Art yeah. right here on this side yeah. as well. Yeah. Yes. And the gospel, it's the same gospel. Uh, there's at least eight versions of the atonement in the New Testament itself. So, you know, settling on one explanation for how we are saved, et cetera, is probably not God's intention. Uh, but uh, the, the essence of the gospel is that God is on our side. The essence of the gospel that God is centered on us, desires our best good. And I think so many of us feel like we have to earn God's favor. Uh, that was the whole thing during the Reformation, you know, people having to buy forgiveness from God. What a horrible picture of God's character that is that there's a God who would demand, you know, payment, demand blood, et cetera, in order to forgive. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, the gospel remains the same, but it's a gospel in an end time context. And uh, that's one reason I think the Bible has so many pictures of the atonement. If you think of sin as a debt that you owe, what's the solution? Forgiveness. It's a banking metaphor, you see, forgiveness. Uh, if you believe that you are guilty in God's judgment, that's sin. That's the problem of sin. What you need is justification. You need acquittal by the judge to be freed from that guilt. Uh, if you think of sin as being dirty, it's a sanctuary metaphor. You need cleansing. If you think of sin as a disease, you need to be made whole. That's a medical metaphor and one that's been popular through the years at Loma Linda. So you see, God, because we have limited capacity to understand, God has given us multiple metaphors of what the gospel is. But the core element is we need it and God provides what we need. And that gospel in the end time context may have new metaphors, uh, new ways of expression that will be more powerful today. I think, John, the first time I, years ago now, I guess, came across that concept of the different models in the New Testament was from a scholar named John Pauline, and it was very helpful to me. Thank you very much. Annette? Dr. Pauline, I just needed clarification on when you mentioned fo Satan followed the male child to heaven, so he still had access to heaven after Jesus was born? So she's asking, uh, uh, the male child was caught up to Satan. Uh, did Satan still have access to heaven after Jesus was born? Did I get yeah. that right? Well, Jesus seems to say that the cross is the decisive event that casts him down. When Jesus is lifted up from the earth, uh, that's the context in which Satan is cast down. Uh, so what the cross did was convince the unfallen universe that Satan's a liar and, and he's lost his credibility in heaven. Uh, at the moment of the ascension is apparently where this final struggle takes place. And it's interesting, in Revelation 5, you have Jesus joining the Father on his throne, no mention of Satan whatsoever. So Satan was cast out, and then Jesus could be enthroned uh, as the ruler of this earth. See, remember in Job, Satan came up as the ruler of this earth. He came up just to, to represent his people, so to speak, all right, and talk about Job and everybody else. Um, once Jesus is enthroned in heaven, then he's the one in charge of this earth, and Satan has no more authority. Unfortunately, uh, we on this earth haven't quite figured that out yet, and so he still has quite a bit of power here. But his power is greatest, the accusation power. If you allow him to accuse you, that will harm you more than a bad movie. You know, if you are deeply discouraged and, and don't really believe that God will accept you, uh, he's got you. Uh, you're his, you know. So, so this whole idea of who God is is critical for us to believe that there's hope for us. And that's why I think it's so important to emphasize that. 
I want to thank John again for this afternoon and for the continuing insights. Uh, the longer I spend with, read about, study, and listen to teaching about Revelation, the more in admiration I am of that amazing document, and the more integrated it becomes into the whole of Scripture, and therefore the much deeper is the meaning therein contained. So thank you. Thank you for a wonderful view of God and God's character and the fact that we can trust in a good and a gracious God. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for all the blessings you continually bestow. Thank you for what you have done, are doing, and will do. We pray that you would keep us in the grip of your grace and you would guide us with your heart that we might follow you from this day all the way into your very kingdom. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.